Welcome to the Smart Secure Borders and Ports via 5G panel. Our panelists today are Russell Becker, the Director for the Office for Compatibility and Interoperability Technology Centers at Science and Technology within DHS, Vincent Sridipan, the Acting Section Chief for Cyber QSMO at CISA, also within DHS, Andy Stewart, the Senior National Security and Government Strategist for Cybersecurity at Cisco, and Rear Admiral John W. Mauger, the Assistant Commandant for Capability at the U.S. Coast Guard. This panel will be moderated by Dr. Cedric Sims, the Senior Vice President at Booz Allen Hamilton. Now over to Cedric Sims. Cedric? Thank you, Tom. Hello. My name is Cedric Sims. I'm a Senior Vice President with Booz Allen Hamilton and responsible for the Department of Homeland Security, Justice and Transportation business. Today, I'm so excited to have a discussion with some very impactful and impressive government and private sector executives that are leading the way in the charge around 5G. We have an incredible panel today to include Admiral John Mauger, Vincent Serpan, Russell Becker, and Andy Stewart. But very quickly, I'd ask each, as I go through, to introduce themselves, and then we'll get into our panel discussion. Admiral Mauger. Thanks, Cedric. I'm Rear Admiral John Mauger. I'm the Assistant Commandant for Capability for the Coast Guard. Uh, my primary job is really making sure that our frontline operators are successful, and I do that by supplying them with the capabilities that they need to achieve their missions. Today, I'm gonna to speak to you as both a regulator and a law enforcement operator. The great thing about your Coast Guard is that we wear so many different hats, but it can be confusing. Uh, and so I'll try and preface my comments uh, to provide appropriate context. As a regulator, I'm really excited, but I'm also concerned about the spread of 5G throughout the maritime community. Ships and ports handle more than 90% 90, 90 of the world's trade. And within the U.S., the maritime transportation system accounts for 25% of U.S. GDP. These are huge numbers, and there's tremendous opportunity to increase capacity, reduce environmental impact, ensure safety, and it, through increased connectivity that 5G provides. But it must be done securely and resiliently. As an operator, I'm eager to take advantage of the promise of 5G. I look forward to the discussion today. Thanks, Cedric. Admiral Mauger, thank you so much. Now, Vincent Sertipan. Hi, my name is Vincent Sertipan with the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency. I'm the Section Chief for Cyber Quality Service Management Office, uh, where I actually lead service innovation. Uh, so think of things like uh, mobile cybersecurity shared services. These are things that are new and coming online. Uh, others uh, I'm also responsible for include, uh, I'm the CISA 5G Research and Development Lead uh, for CISA and that partnership with DHS Science and Technology Directorate. Uh, additionally, I co-chair the Federal Mobility Group uh, with uh, folks like GSA and NIST, who are also the co-chairs. Um, a lot of the efforts that, I, that I'll be talking about today, and, and really a pleasure to be here, it really talks about sort of not only the promise of 5G, but from a cybersecurity professional's point of view, how does that impact us? What, what is it going to take? Um, we, we really bridge the gap, at least with Federal Mobility Group, uh, to connect those who own and operate mobile programs across federal departments and agencies. And so very much there's a, a great collaboration effort, um, not only with our group and, and with others, but thank you for having me today. Vincent, thank you so much and welcome to the panel. Now, Russell Becker. Thank you, Cedric. Uh, Russell Becker, I'm the director of the Office for Interoperability and Compatibility within the DHS Science and Technology Directorate. Within uh, the Office for Interoperability and Compatibility, we focus on the uh, providing capabilities to our uh, components and our first responders uh, born right out of the 9-11 Commission and the, the lack of uh, interoperability that was uh, seen and, and experienced after that. Uh, we look at both improving existing uh, capabilities, existing technologies, but we also look to the, uh, the future emerging technologies. And um, not only are we looking at the uh, providing capabilities, we're looking at the risk associated with those uh, capabilities. Um, and, and we're also looking at uh, not just sheer technology, but also uh, the processes and people. 
um, and, and how we uh, can change those to uh, redeploy uh, and, and more efficiently use our limited uh, resources at those critical points in time. Thank you. Russell, thank you. And now, Andy Stewart. Thanks, Cedric. I'm Andy Stewart, retired Navy captain. I served for 30 years in the U.S. Navy, retiring from Fleet Cyber Command, U.S. 10th Fleet, and having served as a commanding officer, uh, program manager, a Navy Cyber Warfare Development Group. At Cisco, I continue to serve the government uh, as a national security strategist, providing solutions uh, for, from Cisco to solve the mission needs of our federal government customers. Andy, thank you. And as a federal government executive and as someone also too that has benefited from all the wonderful work that goes into the Homeland Security missions, as well as those also for our national defense, I wanna thank each of you for your, for your proud service that you've given to our nation. And let's look forward to a great discussion around 5G. So today, our topic is around smart borders and securing borders and the application of 5G in that domain. There are a lot of interesting things that are emerging here around the implementation of 5G and its impact on critical infrastructure, as well as maybe some unique matters around cybersecurity. So with that, let's open up with the first question. Let's talk a little bit about the cyber threat that's likely to change as a result of 5G. Admiral Magruder, would you be kind enough to give us some of your thoughts in that regard. Sure. Thank you, Cedric. Um, as a regulator, I think we all understand that the cyber threat's already present uh, in our ports. It's no secret that the maritime industry is now wholly reliant on global interconnectedness and the seamless flow of electronic information to make that system work on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, the Colonial Pipeline ransomware attack, it's just a clear example that disruptions to current IT systems can have a cascading effect uh, on the operations uh, of that total uh, system. Um, to get after the current threat, the Coast Guard's already implemented regulations and policies to address cyber risks within the maritime transportation system. We've leveraged both the Maritime Transportation Security Act, and we've worked very closely with the International Maritime Organization uh, to make sure that both our domestic ports and the international ships that are coming to those ports um, are able to assess uh, and mitigate uh, cyber risks and report cybersecurity incidents to us. At the same time, we're working with FEMA to uh, use the Port Security Grant Program to get after uh, the development and incorporation of enabling technology that allow ports and uh, maritime transportation system owners to be uh, able to uh, address those cybersecurity risks. So when we look at 5G, um, what we see is that it's gonna promote greater sensorization and interconnectedness across all segments of the maritime transportation system. And so this is gonna bring a couple of additional cybersecurity risks to us. I'm particularly concerned about ensuring that adequate security is baked into the 5G standards and that the end, the uh, accompanying architecture for internet of, of things within the port community. I think that one of the challenges is given that this is going to happen incrementally, we're going to see backwards compatibility between 5G, 4G, and 3G, and we're going to bring along some of those security vulnerabilities of those older systems while we're taking advantage of the best that 5G has to offer. Uh, so that's a concern about how do we phase this in and get security right. I'm also concerned about the increasing sophistication of uh, um, supply chain vulnerabilities and the problems that we might see uh, with 5G there. Uh, I think in closing, uh, information has really always been a key asset as part of the maritime transportation system. Under 5G, it's going to be increasingly important. And so I think one of the strategies that uh, we need the industry to adopt here is that as they continue to invest in 5G, um, I want them to treat their information with the same protection and the same primary focus as their primary uh, cargo systems that, they've, uh, that they use now. I think that's a key strategy to help the industry get after this. But I look forward to hearing about some of the industry solutions through the panel. Thank you. Admiral Margaret, thank you so much. Um, You've mentioned uh, uh, critical infrastructure in your comments. And so with that, I'd like to turn toward Vincent uh, and the unique position that the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency may have. So 
Will you share your thoughts with us, Vincent? Thank you. So, so with 5G technology, as you know, this brings a multitude of advanced component technologies together to really offer improved capabilities and efficiencies. I think that this is a great thing, right? So we talk about multi-access edge compute and, and the ability to do you know, everything from enhanced mobile broadband to ultra reliable low latency communications, the massive machine type communications. There, there's, there's great there to apply to a specific you know, border, you know, port use case for, for Homeland Security. I'll note that that this uh, provides complexity. So just I'll, I'll echo you know, and agree with, with Admiral mentioning the, the supply chain concerns. Um, the also until 5G sort of standalone becomes a, a sort of the normalcy then uh, here in implementation, then all of the 4G and below concerns will be sort of inherent and in, in just in the, in the 4G non-standalone capabilities. Um, I'll also note that you have to think about this not only from a, yes, we're gonna have more edge compute, we're gonna have more nodes, so IoT, all these other aspects will be able to massively uh, connect and, and interoperate uh, hopefully uh, with what we need to accomplish our mission, but note that it goes both ways, right? And so if we use, as an example, drones for, for, the, for the border to, to you know, surveil over our adversary or in some aspect, um, then it could also be used against us, right? So there's needs to be that, that understanding of 5G is also a capability that enhances our mission, but it also has risks associated. So there's just both the, the cybersecurity, you know, standards, you know, 3GPP, SA3 type of uh, aspect of baking in security, but there's also the sort of operational technology as you look at this application where, hey, we also need to be concerned with our own, you know, law enforcement, our own safety going forward. So definitely supply chain, uh, you know, legacy protocol vulnerabilities are, are there and understanding sort of how that applies operationally, right? Th this, these are the key things when we think about risk management in, in 5G as we move forward. Vincent, thank you so much. Um, several times now, border has been brought forward as a, as a topic area. And so um, if I may start with you, Russell, on this, um, how will 5G impact more Thomas border control systems? Uh, th thank you, Cedric. Uh, that, that's a loaded question there. I mean, so much, uh, there's actually so much we don't know. Um, and we continue to do research in, in that area to, to uncover uh, everything from specific use cases to um, um, the highlighting those, those risks. Um, and, and even uh, exploring the, the opportunities. So some things that you might look at, um, when we look at uh, autonomous systems, um, uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, for example, trying to cross border um, checkpoints, uh, th this is gonna present uh, a number of challenges with uh, questions such as how, how do you pull over a vehicle? Um, whenever uh, border patrol agents say I, we need to check it that check that close more closely, um, there's also uh, there's opportunities here with the autonomous systems enabling um, uh, interrogation of commercial uh, autonomous vehicles, comparing registration, cargo inventory, safety checks. Um, uh, on the, the vehicle status, uh, inventory logs, uh, integration of sensors to do inspections for things such as hazmat or, or contraband, uh, agricultural temperature, humidity, and other types of sen sensing to be integrated as well. Um, so, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, how do you pull over a vehicle? That human to machine interaction challenge that's gonna be presented, how do you pull that over out of lane into a, a, a specific check uh, point. And as well, um, the, we, we talk about borders, but the borders, uh, while physical, you can see a fence or you can see a line, uh, the, um, the signals from 5G are, um, don't know those borders. And so you're looking at challenges of, uh, is it a, um, Canadian or an American um, side of the border um, tower that's um, uh, that you're communicating through, or is it a Mexican side or U.S. side? Um, well, that's going to introduce challenges with regards to the mobile edge compute, uh, the handoffs. When when do I hand off uh, the control of that 
when is the handoff of the control communications for that vehicle transitioning across the U.S. side to the Canadian side? Uh, there's going to be challenges with things like quality of service or, or prioritization, ensuring that you maintain the same level uh, as you transition for um, uh, primarily for safety. Um, and I, I, I think that's just a, a few things. Uh, thank you. Well, very thought provoking, Russell, and I appreciate that very much. I know, Vincent, in some prior discussions, you had a few thoughts about that, if you wouldn't mind sharing those. And I know that we also too want to hear from uh, Admiral Mauger about some of the unique things that might be happening in the maritime domain. So Vincent, please. Yeah, so so the what Russell mentioned, the ultra reliable low latency communications really to ensure you know autonomous vehicles is, is definitely needed um, and, and impactful. I'll say just to add on a couple of small things, which is you know, if we think about autonomous border control systems and, and the 5G impact, it's, it's really the massive machine type communications that enable, right, for 5G to make this possible. So think about all the, the camera surveillance, the sensors in the ground or all, all the above that are now going to be interconnected, right? And so that, that's really where we see this as a, as a game changer. Uh, also note that you also can think about things like network slicing and optimization. So autonomous, you know, capabilities bringing on the ability to ensure quality of service um, and, and differentiating that and protecting that is, is also there. And, and last I'll note, just enhanced mobile broadband capability. So as you think about uh, whatever uh, aspect of the border or the port you're looking at, the, the mission user, end user in this case, really needs high resolution capabilities, right? To see things, to take actions upon things. So uh, 5G enables all of this, right? So the uh, 5G impacting autonomous border control systems is really there because it provides the pipe, uh, the connectivity and that reliability, right? So just noting that uh, over to the Admiral. Hey, thanks Vincent. Uh, really appreciate how you frame that. And uh, also very much as an operator, appreciate the work that uh, Russell and s and are doing to uh, help us really understand this and, and, and incorporate uh, the benefits of this technology into our operations. I want to come back for a second just to kind of the breadth and scope of the problem that we're facing in the maritime domain. Again, 90 plus percent of the world's commerce uh, travels by uh, ship. 25 percent of U.S. GDP comes in and, and goes out through uh, our ports. And so there's a lot uh, going on in the ports. And so what I would say is uh, some of us on the panel are of a certain age where we remember what it's like to drive on I-95 or on the turnpike and have to stop every several, uh, every couple of miles at a toll booth to do a manual transaction and hand off that money. And if you were out driving over Memorial Day weekend, um, you know, you might be stuck in a, in a long backup at a toll booth for a long period of time just waiting to get through there. Well, today, you know, I can, uh, we can get collectively get more capacity out of that highway just by having those toll booths automatically interrogate my car as I drive through in, at speed. And so we're able to get more out of uh, the system. As an operator, I look forward to those benefits that uh, Vincent and Russell described. I look forward to automatically interrogating ships, managing traffic flows through the port. Um, it'll enable us to be more seamless and sort through lawful and illegal uh, uh, trade and entry and better protect our borders and security. I think one of the key that uh, allows us to get there, as Vincent talked about, was is the ability to untether from existing power and network infrastructure that to provide a more comprehensive uh, network of sensors and information to improve our operations. What I would also say, though, it's not just a nice to have, it's really an imperative. You heard from the previous panelists about the threat of um, unmanned autonomous systems operating in the air, on the surface of the water, and under the surface of the water, and the threat that they pose. It's really now more important than ever that we have a comprehensive uh, sensor network that's really able to uh, detect, uh, prosecute, uh, both lawful and illegal trade, and, and enable us to get the maximum capacity out of this system. Thanks very much for the opportunity to comment. Thank all of you so much for your insightful uh, thoughts that you've shared here, as well as some additional things I think will be uh, helping us to be a little bit more thought-provoking around um, not just the opportunity, but also some of the risks that may be introduced by this great technology. Andy, I'd really love to get you uh, pulled into the discussion here. And, 
we've talked a lot about all these systems and capabilities, but we can imagine there's probably a lot of data involved and other things on that order. But even more so, there's some very you know, interesting additional technologies like AI and advanced analytics. So how do you think that that might actually uh, change the security model? Thanks, Cedric. Uh, you know, Cisco has been working globally to enable terminal operators and port authorities to upgrade, digitally transform their terminal operating systems and infrastructure. But we are embedding AI and advanced analytics directly into modern terminal networking and security architectures uh, through the employment of private LTE, Wi-Fi 6, Mesh, LoRaWAN technologies, and moving into 5G, AI and advanced analytics will continue to underpin port and terminal multi-access wireless strategies. So I believe AI and advanced analytics will provide basically three fundamental capabilities at the high level for any architecture. The first being network visibility, next network automation and network segmentation and security, all of which will be more important as 5G capabilities are implemented and realized. And just to give you an idea of scope and scale and kind of build on the Admiral's thoughts about what you know modern terminal operations look like, consider that in a modern terminal, you have multiple numbers and kinds of edge nodes besides access control and security gates. You have automated straddle carriers, cranes, automatic guided vehicles that move containers throughout a terminal, uh, as well as other equipment and personnel moving autonomously and semi-autonomously around the facility. And most, if not all of those individual edge node nodes are running small LANs on board the node itself. And each can have multiple access technologies involved, both wired and wireless. So just as an example, one straddle carrier's LAN could have multiple PLCs, over 20 plus cameras and several other devices for operations and especially for safety requirements. And they will employ both private LTE, soon to be 5G, in order to communicate to the terminal, but simultaneously could need to employ a mesh network to communicate from the crane to the ground, because it's not only about latency, performance, and security requirements, physics and RF propagation and spectrum also get involved when you have very large steel components, cranes, metal containers moving around each other, affecting RF links and you know, particularly roaming performance. Uh, so my point is there's a lot of data flowing to and from many sources via many means from multiple edge nodes into the main terminal operating system. And 5G adds to that complexity, not only in terms of its performance as, other wire, as another wireless access technology, but because it brings technologies like multi-access edge computing or MEC to the environment, which will bring more edge compute, more applications and enable more autonomous operations in the you know, in industrial automation. So just to give you a scale and sense of you know, what we're talking about here, the very first thing we deploy is a deep packet inspection sensor capability called Cisco CyberVision that goes directly into the infrastructure, switches wireless access points that allows us to more efficiently extract metadata from the network flows understand the environment. And the big impact here is visibility, not only of all the terminal assets, but also visibility of the data and application flows and interactions between the assets and the terminal operating system. And with this visibility, terminal operator, operators immediately have not only a dynamic mapping capability, but they have a real-time inventory of all the resources, assets, applications, data flows, and everything down to the manufacturer model firmware version and installed hardware extensions. And especially in the context of what additional capabilities 5G will bring, starting with this level of visibility of data flows and communication patterns between terminal systems assets and applications allows both for enhanced network segmentation and security and network automation to be deployed at scale all the way down and inside those individual edge lands that I talked about. So once you understand and map the appropriate network flows, you can enforce policy and implement least privilege access and micro segmentation across network access, applications, users, and devices. And you must build these capabilities directly into an ISA 95 and NIST standards informed architecture. So AI and advanced analytics are a must for visibility and then for network automation and network segmentation security when you're operating at this type of scale and speed.
Andy, thank you for those thoughts. And um, one of the things that uh, Booz Allen is uniquely looking at in the context of 5G, is the ways in which the AI and ML could be applied to actually detect anomalies and malicious behavior on those networks. So when they aren't performing or they're performing perhaps in a way that demonstrates or indicates a compromise uh, to be able to put out the proper alerts and warnings and things on that order, especially as 5G becomes more of a, an effective tool uh, that may even be uh, you know, put into private uh, utilizations more so than just the traditional commercial you know, thoughts that might go around that. So thank you very much. And I think that we're all here uh, working against some of the same problems and challenges. So to that end, uh, let's have a, a quick discussion around sensors and, and data processing. And if I can, Vincent, I'd like to start with you. About your thoughts about, you know, what do you think will be needed in commercial, in these commercial systems or in the future systems uh, necessary to support the kind of sensors and data processing that will happen and be enabled by 5G? Yeah, so, so I think that 5G technology and communications really is going to increase and improve data collection analytics, right? So you talked about AI and advanced analytics. I think that um, commercial adoption, integration of these capabilities, not just, you know, we'll, we'll talk about cybersecurity and, and sort of implementation of the standard, just because it's in the standard doesn't actually mean it's in the deployment or implementation, right? So just, just putting it out there, I think I just, I always, I always go back to FCC and CTIA Wireless Association did a great job with the with the CISRIC reports, right? And, and those are awesome, right? To recommendations on how to, you know, deal with uh, sort of legacy and, and diameter SS7 type threats, but but the implementation of those things are, are what's key, right? Um, and so I, I would say that um, moving quicker to address, and, and they're doing a good job now as an example to, to turn off certainly 2G network type, type legacy networks. Uh, but I would say that um, when you look at uh, 5G and, and the use cases, and I know they're, they're all trying to do things, you know, real time uh, sort of uh, data processing and correlation uh, for, for various mission purposes. But as we look at this, I think the, the service to, you know, an integration of solution sets with, with the carrier networks, you're seeing this probably with a lot of the, you know, the, the DOD OUSD RNE efforts that you see with the different tranche efforts. Those are, you, you name all the, the, the big carriers are also on those. Um, but I, I will note that that piece of, uh, you know, working together to implement the actual standards, working together to safeguard our capabilities, the site, the types of sensors we're going to bring on board. I mean, you, you got to look at how, you know, what what IoT standard do we actually have to follow, right? And, and, and what's the, the sort of the crown jewels? Yes, there's a NIST standard. Yes, there's a lot of things out there, but that's a, a problem as a whole that, that maybe industry can get around. Uh, in order for us to take advantage of, of a new communication systems like this, um, there needs to be some sort of a level set on where industry standards and implements them, proves them out, um, and then also works with us because eventually we'll get to the, you know, more private, uh, you know, 4G LTE and, and so private networks that are available to say on a base or, or on a, you know, maybe a port of entry or things of that nature. Um, but, but that is where, you know, that public private partnership works together and they, they actually prove that out, right, going forward. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Russell, we have just a few more minutes left. Any or uh, any thoughts on the construct around sensors and data processing? Um, yes, thank you. Um, it, I, I think that uh, as Vincent talked about, the, the public part, um, private partnerships are going to uh, be unique, pre present some unique uh, challenges and opportunities uh, because we're, we're going to have to be able to integrate uh, sensors, sensor capabilities that, that we don't own um, as government, how we're going to create those partnerships to ensure that we're able to integrate those. When you look at things um, such as uh, sensors, how do I um, tag, say, a um, crew or, or um, a passenger, and how do I track them and their luggage and or goods through different lanes, um, th there are gonna be additional sensors required to do that, uh, tag them and maintain that uh, association um, uh, to that specific uh, luggage or, or, or cargo. Um, and there'll as well be biometric sensors um, uh, so that we can um, move fluidly or smoothly through these um, 
these uh, ports. Uh, finally, I, I, I emphasize the the AI or the um, uh, the infrastructure needs at that forward edge are are just off the charts compared to what we're we're dealing with today. Um, and thank you. Yeah, I understand. No, I understand. No, they they really are, and, and the, the the needs and the requirements for the the edge compute capability and what we are anticipating we can achieve with five G is really going to push those uh, expectations uh, well beyond our current uh, imagination. Uh, Andy, did you have any thoughts that you'd like to share with us on this matter? Yeah, I think, and just also relating this back to where we started with some discussion about supply chain uh, with regard mm -hmm. to networking and communication systems, uh, it's important to remember that port infrastructure often sits in open, relatively unsecured spaces. So employment of anti-tamper technologies, physical hardware and software base is critical. But also with 5G being cloud native and completely software driven, it's important to recognize 5G will be leveraging open source technologies. And although it's critical for scalability and allowing cloud development integrations, certainly vulnerabilities from multiple open source applications could be exploited by attackers. So this is pretty topical given the recent executive order recommendations you know, made by the Cyberspace Solarium Commission and probably inclusive of future legislation and other efforts like the DOD's CMMC program. So in order to reduce this attack service and respond to government requirements, vendor specific secure development processes need to be implemented to ensure product trustworthiness. And not just documenting them on paper, but trustworthy products and systems should include hardware based trust anchor modules that can be technically interrogated to ensure that they have not been compromised and capabilities such as secure boot entropy, immutable identity, image signing, common cryptography, uh, secure storage and runtime integrity validation. These are all technologies that Cisco has been delivering with our products for a long time, along with physical and anti-tamper protections. But with the greater adoption of 5G and with what we're hearing from both the executive and legislative branches of government, these types of technologies, along with assessing and validating a vendor's supply chain security, their secure de development lifecycle practices will be critical and system administrators will have to be vigilant when it comes to continuously monitoring hardware, software, and systems operational integrity to detect and, and mitigate infrastructure uh, and service tampering. So operators should insist that their end-to-end -end network infrastructure has a continuously verifiable route of trust. Andy, thank you very much. Well, we're at the conclusion of our panel, but what I'd like to do very quickly, if we have, um, if we can, just a very, very quick uh, lightning round here, 30 seconds or less. I'd love to kind of get your uh, your thoughts on our discussion. If you have any closing thoughts that you'd like to provide, maybe a final word. So if I may, I'd like to begin with Admiral Mauger. Thanks so much, Cedric. Uh, really appreciate the uh, panel today. It's been great to hear from folks. I think the thing that I took away from this is uh, kind of two words, opportunity and then risk, right? And they go hand in hand. On the opportunity, we talked about the breadth of uh, what this industry does uh, across the globe and, and for the nation in terms of uh, the commerce and trade that's supported. Uh, on the risk, uh, we heard that we're not going to uh, achieve this opportunity um, and get sustainable benefits out of it without an executive level focus on security and resiliency. Vincent gave us some of the keys. Uh, Vincent said implementation is absolutely critical. You can't just rely on the, the standards and the technology. Andy talked about uh, the, the benefits of segmentation and micro segmentation, particularly as you distribute this across the port. And then Russell mentioned, you know, the importance of private uh, public partnerships to get after this. From the Coast Guard's perspective, we're out there. Uh, we have regulations in place for cyber to help the industry get after cyber risk management. As an operator, I look forward to the opportunities to really discriminate and segregate uh, lawful and, and illegal trade uh, out there along our uh, uh, borders and coastline. Thanks so much for the time to talk today. Sir, thank you so much for your uh, contributions uh, to this panel and also your service. Russell, you're up. Thank you again. It has been a uh, great experience to, to be with all of you uh, gentlemen in this uh, the panel. And uh, I'll tell you, one of the biggest things I took away was actually the uh, has to do with the, the AI and the edge uh, 
moving the AI to the edge, uh, compute uh, capability. And, and, I, and I, it's really brought to me the realization we have opportunities there, uh, absolutely their risk, but there are opportunities to do more processing at, on, on location and, um, and not have to transport uh, information. Uh, so we're able to maintain privacy uh, for our, our citizens while still uh, accomplishing the mission. Um, and again, I really appreciate having uh, the opportunity to, to speak with each one of you. Thank you. Russell, again, thank you so much for your service also. Andy, thank you. your thoughts. Thanks, Cedric. I would just quickly reflect that many of the conversations around 5G, I think over the last year, sort of remind me of the conversations uh, around cloud maybe five or six years ago. Uh, and what we found was cloud did not replace the need for sound networking and security ar architecture. It actually highlighted the need to have a better one and to think about it deliberately uh, from an architectural point of view. So likewise, I think 5G amplifies the need for a strong networking and security architecture based on a zero trust philosophy from edge to cloud. Andy, thank you. And again, as always, as I was mentioning before, thank you for your service also, your many years in the military and continuing to serve the important nations that uh, help uh, our, our security. So thank you again. Vincent, your thoughts, sir. So I'll just agree with the, the fine gentleman's comments uh, all throughout. I think that, that was on point. Um, I'll just leave with the, the notion of uh, if you want to visit cisa.gov forward slash 5G to find out, you know, risk characterization and threat in this topic, uh, recommendations, best practices, those types of things. Um, that, that's a great place to go. So cisa.gov forward slash 5G. Lastly, I, I will note that um, if you Google or no, sorry, you should search for uh, uh, a framework to conduct 5G testing. This is something we did. You can find it on cio.gov with the Federal Mobility Group. It's just to give a sense that not only industry, but to government on, on the methodology that could be used when you look at 5G testing and what it entails, what it takes from spectrum to standards to outdoor, indoor uh, uh, understanding. Uh, of, of the, sort of that environment. So please take, do take a look at that. It's framework to conduct 5G testing and it, you can find it on CIO.gov. Thanks. Vincent, thank you. And thank you for those public service announcements also uh, to make sure we get the messages out to the communities and also for the leadership you're providing, not just within CISA, which has such a huge impact on our civilian federal government, as well as our commercial partners and other stakeholders, but, but also the leadership you're providing uh, through the federal CIO council to the, to the whole of government. So again, thank you so much for your service. And with that, we're at the conclusion of our panel. Again, I wanna thank all of our panelists for the great insights and, uh, and that they've shared, not only about the missions that they serve, but also about the things that we all need to be able to consider as we move forward in this very vital area. And with that, I wanna thank Billington and the Security Summit for the opportunity to share this insight. Hopefully everyone that joined us today really enjoyed this experience. I certainly have myself. And with that, Tom, thank you so much for providing this opportunity for us. Thank you.